Good evening and welcome to the cinema of Deutsches Filmmuseum. I welcome you all to the very last event in our accompanying series to the current Jubilee exhibition, Kubrick's 2001, 50 Years of a Space Odyssey. Our current Jubilee exhibition lasts until uh, next Sunday, so uh, the 23rd of September. If you haven't seen it yet or want to go there another time, uh, you still have a couple of days the opportunity for that and we will also have another very last screening of 2001 a space odyssey in this cinema next wednesday on the 19th of september at 8 30 pm so if you want to have uh, seen kubrick's classic once more on the big screen that's the last opportunity accompanying our jubilee exhibition it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce tonight's special guest um, to you uh, we will have the possibility some time for uh, discussion and Q&A after the screening of Tony Ciara's uh, last film, Film Worker, uh, featuring Leon Vitali. And please join me in welcoming Tony Ciara. Uh, Tony uh, has been fascinated by the power of storytelling and cinema since his childhood. And um, he took film classes at uh, the NYU and later at Texas A&M and at UCLA. And he made three documentaries before Film Worker, uh, Carving Out Our Name was the first, following the lives of four actors hoping to find success in Hollywood. Then um, a documentary to capture America's reaction to the attacks of, of September 11. Uh, in 2001, USA the movie, and finally, My Big Break, a cautionary tale about the darker side of celebrity and the consequences of fame. So I guess one could uh, link all these projects together that he focuses his films show a, a strong interest in uh, the backside stories of the industry and also um, the behind the scenes um, uh, stories and uh, he's not only finished um, film worker last year which premiered at the Cannes Film Festival uh, and uh, won many many awards uh, so far with his documentaries um, and we are very proud that we have Tony here for tonight for a discussion and a screening and it's also the Frankfurt premiere of his film and I'm uh, very curious about um, something uh, to hear uh, something from you how the project started uh, how you came in touch with uh, Leon Vitali for the first time uh, and we will have time to discuss it with you after the screening um, so please uh, give us a little introduction to your uh, latest documentary um, so um, thank you for having me and thank you for being here um, uh, film worker started actually by accident because um, I was working on a Kubrick documentary and Leon Vitali was really up there on the list to talk to because he was the closest, I would say, um, not, it's a fact, the closest to Stanley Kubrick when it came to creativity. And so I met with Leon for the project titled SK-13, the 13 projects of uh, Kubrick. Uh, and I was struck by Leon's story and how he was living. and. Um, I felt like this was more of um, uh, the unsung heroes of cinema, in a sense, the people that you really don't hear about, but with, without them, you won't, we won't have that legacy, the same legacy we have of Stanley Kubrick. And so um, I let the film speak for itself. You'll see what Leon had to go through to uh, uh, finish the work he did with Kubrick and restore all his films. Um, and then, of course, after we shot, I felt like the... Um, Knowing Leon um, gave me more information about the Kubrick documentary that, that I'm working on now. Um, so I'm currently editing SK-13. Um, it's a bit complicated. We'll talk about it later. And I'll also give you an update on Leon. I was hoping that Leon would make it here today, but uh, timing and health, it's, it's a bit rough. But... Um, I've filmed with him for about like 300 hours, so I pretty much know everything. If you have any questions that, um, that I could answer for you and uh, give you some insights also about what's going on with him today. So thank you. Thank you, Tony. So uh, tonight's projectionist is Günther Volkmann and I wish you a wonderful screening and we'll be back after film work. Uh, enjoy the screening.
Sorry. So um, thank you so much, uh, Tony, for bringing this this film to us. It's the Frankfurt premiere tonight, but you've already uh, screened it once in in Germany at the Munich um, Dog Film Festival. Yeah, but I wasn't there. You wasn't there. How was the audience reception so far with film <laughs> film work? <laughs> I wasn't there. Uh, with the other screenings you've had. Uh, oh no, it's been great. I mean, it's um, well, um, well, it's been packed full house especially in new york la places like that uh especially places that where leon is that he was able to go also and be present so um yeah it varies but yeah it's been a great turnout and the film had uh, if i understood it correctly uh released in the uk and the us so far yes theatrically uh it, it uh, been released in the us uk and um and i think this in two weeks um would be uh, Sweden and uh, Belgium, the whole pan Scandinavian, and um, and then Japan, I believe, after that, and uh, China, in places like that. Germany, not yet, and France, not yet. Even though we premiered at Cannes, so <laughs> we're still working on that deal. How was it to have this film premiered at Cannes? Uh, could you tell us a Ooh, little bit how yeah. you send it in and how you uh, received the message to be selected for Cannes? How was that, it for you? That, that's a good story, actually. Um, uh, because Cannes was the first place I submitted to. Um, I was My concern, as you saw in the film, I was really concerned about Leon's health towards the end. And I, um, I've mentioned earlier that I was working on a Kubrick documentary, and that's how I met Leon. And so then um, when I saw the situation he was in, I felt that I should really sh film qu quick as possible and finish so Leon would be around to, to enjoy the acknowledgement. Um, and so when I was done editing, uh, Cannes was the first festival that was coming up. And I submitted hoping that, I mean, again, those things are here or miss. You, it does, that doesn't mean you'll get in. But... Um, all my energy was focused on getting into Cannes, so Leon would, would go with me. And um, then when we got accepted, um, I called Leon, and, and then we managed to get him to, to Cannes, and I remember that they said um, that he has to have a tux, and I had to have a tux. I didn't have a tux. So um, they found me a tux in, in uh, Cannes. And, um, but Leon said, actually, I have Tom Cruise's in the closet from Eyes Wide Shut. <laughs> And uh, and I said you never told me that because I actually cleaned Leon's house so many times. Because, like, all the boxes that you saw, um, which is another story I'll tell you in a sec. But um, so he yeah he put the Tom Cruise uh, uh, tuxedo from Eyes Wide Shut and showed up and um, and he had a, like a five six minute standing ovation. His children were in tears and because they didn't really know what their father has done, except that he was just an assistant. And um, it was quite a uh, quite an experience, you know. And that was beautiful. But I guess besides you, nobody noticed or recognized Tom Cruise's. No. <laughs> <laughs> they actually people think that Leon is really a big guy, but uh, he's exactly like uh, Stanley's okay. Stanley Kubrick size and Tom Cruise's size. So it was okay. perfect. And he had it in the closet. And, and I said, "Then you're struggling. You could have sold it for a long time ago." <laughs> but that's Leon, you know. He would never sell it. But please uh, tell us about the boxes. Um, so the boxes you saw in uh, in the shed upstairs, actually, those were created by me because um, really everything in the boxes was basically all over the floor, everywhere, all over the house, and it's quite a big house. Um, but it was just overwhelming for Leon to to keep up with and to organize. And um, and I remember when we started filming, he Leon was. Um, he, he was so reserved. He didn't want to talk about himself. He could talk to you about Kubrick till like he'll put you, like he will really knock you out. But when talking about himself, he just kind of wasn't interested. Um, it, for so many years, that's all he did is talk about Kubrick. And, um, and so um, the first week, all the footage I have is just Leon hunched in the chair, like completely like um, Danny in The Shining, not interested. And um, and I remember just looking around and I said, you know what, I'll clean your entire house, organize all your stuff, put it in boxes. That way he would remember as we look through material and uh, at the same time he would gain free cleaning. And, and it worked. Um, but we started to look through things and he would pick up a memo and he would get lost for a little bit and then he would remember Kubrick yelling at him for something or... 
uh, story and um, it kind of refreshed his mind and he kind of just, it was smooth sailing from there, yeah. So it's, uh, uh, to make a bad, bad joke about the, the movie's title, um, uh, kind of Leon Vitali's boxes because there's, of course, this <laughs> Stanley Kubrick's boxes film. Um, I guess you had a longer um, uh, longer time already being impressed by Kubrick's work and especially also 2001, which is of high interest with our Jubilee exhibition. Could you tell us a little bit uh, more about that? When did it all start? What was your first impression when you first saw Kubrick? And was that also um, an impact to uh, draw you to that project? Well, um, you know, my love for Kubrick was way before I met Leon and, and, and before even the, the, the thought of doing a documentary. But what really started the documentary thing was Eyes Wide Shut because I was just anticipating the finale of Kubrick. And when Eyes Wide Shut came out, it was like a complete disaster in America because people just didn't understand the film and it was, um, you know, attacked by the critics badly. Um, and so I kind of became obsessed with the fact that, like, you know, Kubrick wasn't insane. And, 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 and when he died, he said that was his favorite film. So that became more of a, a life mission. And I just ended up watching probably I just watch I know about a thousand times. And, and, and so I started to dig and research and um, spend about three or four years of filming. And then that's when I met Leon. And then... Um, But of course, when I met Leanne, it completely uh, things kind of changed for the story because, um, uh, again, I knew that Leanne was really close to him. I knew that they would like sit at four in the morning and cook together, and all the creativity was channeled through Leon and back because they were both, as I mentioned in the film, they were. I think they were creative addicts. Uh, they, they, you just, you know, like, I mean, you saw Kubrick wouldn't even go to the doctor at the end because he had to just keep working. And Leon is the same kind of mentality. Um, and so I was really fascinated by Leon's kind of take and what, what was Stanley saying. And um, But you and I mentioned, I mentioned earlier that a lot of people that worked for Kubrick that I interviewed, each thinks they were the only ones that did all the work because each was completely overwhelmed because Kubrick was almost like a, he had this brain and personality of like he could, you know, give each person something and make you so swamped with it that but he had the ability to kind of contain and keep things going to um, really an amazing ability. Um, and so um, I just got to really learn more about that, the, the more the friendly, nicer, but also really harsh, as you saw in the film. He was extremely harsh with Leon, and he was extremely loving with Leon, too. And that kind of showed me a different side to the man in, in so many ways. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, uh, when I mentioned earlier about the stuff that we ended up putting in boxes, I would completely find, like, tapes under the couch, and I would put them in, and it would be Kubrick auditioning someone, and I'd be like, you gotta be kidding me, and, and of course, you know, I couldn't push and say, I'm gonna use this, so Leon would kind of pause, pause, and he would go, do you want to use that? And I'm like, are you fucking kidding? Yes, and I would take it, and so Leon is just almost like an exhibit, I mean, his house is almost like an exhibit, and, um, but um, yeah, it was fortunate, you know, I gained so much respect for Leon um, through this project, in the beginning, he was almost like a, a connection to Kubrick because I was so interested in Kubrick. But as we kept filming, it's just almost like Kubrick disappeared and Leon took over. And uh, and I just like ended up really like admiring him as just as an artist on his own. But in the beginning, it was all about Stanley, really, to me. You know, but uh, that, that really happened. And due to your film, um, is there some, at least some, recognition giving back to, to Leon now that it's screened at many festivals and yeah. as a release? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, the the latest was, I mean, I know I can, the even um, um, the press, um, I think it was um, um, uh, the Washington Post, New York Times, they said that the moment, just his standing ovation was the best moving moment at the festival. Um, when we got back, we screened the film at the Academy and um, Leon had a standing ovation and they said they've never given a standing ovation for um, a documentary because Academy members tend to be a bit snobby or I don't know, like very serious. Um, and uh, But since then, they actually agreed to, they recorded his oral history 
He's also now a member of the Academy uh, since the movie was done, and uh, they have restored and preserved film worker in their library. So, And so Leon has been really invited in a lot of places to speak uh, to... Um, you know, when he has a, a screening, he's always surrounded by people for a couple of hours when it's over. I mean, um, it uh, his health completely changed, too, as soon as the movie came out. Uh, he's much better now. Um, I was told, I think, towards the end of that to, to call his children that he had like a week to live. And then once the movie came out, he's doing a lot better, actually. So. I've just uh, recently already mentioned uh, um, Stanley Kubrick's boxes. There are so many other Kubrick's films out, especially during the last years. Um, well, there had been, of course, this this um, biopic uh, on the uh, Alan Conway, uh, Color Me Kubrick, uh, that we've also screened here in the accompanying series. Then there's Jan's, um, Jan Haaland's uh, documentary, Alive in Pictures. And there are so many others, S is for Stanley or The Room 237 by Rodney Escher. How would you contextualize, how would you position your um, film worker uh, within this context? Better, better than all of them, I'll tell you why. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Um, it, it isn't really about gossip or anything. I think it's really about Kubrick's creative process. I was really interested in more of like what made him think of what the amazing things that we see, how he, his brain worked. And um, but uh, Eyes Wide Shut towards the end it really has a personal um, um, connection to Kubrick. Kubrick, the 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 filmmaker, the early early filmmaker. I mean, he owned the material since Spartacus, um, and he's always been going around telling actors, including Ryan O'Neill. He pitched to Ryan O'Neill uh, Eyes Wide Shut, and uh, actually Ryan O'Neill said that the pitch was is that the guy goes to the morgue and the woman is dead, he pulls out her body and he reaches over and kisses her and then she wakes up and grabs his head. And that was the original pitch for um, for Eyes Wide Shut, which that didn't happen in the story. He was always thinking about that film, but there is a really huge connection between that and the original material that I discovered with Arthur Schnitzler, of course, and uh, being Jewish again in New York at the time after World War II. And that film is extremely personal to him. And I, and, I, and, I, and I found what it is that he said that was his greatest contribution to the artist cinema. That's a big line from somebody like Kubrick to say that, again, made 2001 Space Odyssey, let's say. Um, so there is a lot of um, big surprises, but also there is a lot of controversy around him because um, Arlie Ermi in the film, he swore that Kubrick told him before he died that uh, Tom and Nicole ruined the film for him and that the press is going to destroy him. Um, I did ask Jeremy, he said, yes, that's what Kubrick said. But then other people said, no, that's nonsense. So there is a lot of Scientology, obviously, is there. Um, there's a lot of weird stuff in the film and there is, you'll be surprised. Um, you'd be surprised, but I can tell you this much. It's, uh, I think it's a Kubrick movie that hasn't come out yet because there's so much in it that hasn't been seen yet by the audience or understood. And I think that's why I, and, uh, you know this really well. Kubrick's stuff is so layered because he researched so much. I mean, the, the intensity of his research is really un, unheard of. And so every time you see his movies, you see more because the stuff is so layered. Um, and Eyes Wide Shut just really goes way beyond what you see on the screen. And um, and uh, that, that to me is exciting, you know. Uh, coming back to film worker, um, was it difficult for you during the filmmaking um, to keep a critical distance to, to the subject and or the object uh, in a way um, because of your own affirmation for, for Kubrick and Leon? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people still watch it and they go, oh, you know, Kubrick was such an asshole or something like, you know, when they see Phil Morker, they go, he's mistreated Leon. But, you know, it's, um, I I saw the opposite because I think it's, Kubrick did the same thing to himself because um, they were both, Kubrick wasn't one of those that sat on a chair and said action and go get me a cup of coffee. He would really be the only guy a lot, like awake with Leon at two in the morning and everybody left and they would work and just keep going and keep going and keep going. So, and and I like the line that I kept in the middle of the film when Leon said, because he did, he gave everything to what he was doing. 
and and I think that really is what makes the story so unusual. It's that it wasn't a a one sided one person is giving and the other one is just more taking advantage. Um, uh, but of course, Leon should have been, I still believe, taken care of in so many ways. But all that happened really after Kubrick died, and it gets really complicated when um, when somebody's like Kubrick's status in a sense that um you know some people also didn't want to come out and and be filmed uh, for this project because either they felt like i'm not gonna come i'm too big to talk about an assistant and some people actually made a point wanted to come out and talk and um could you give us some examples maybe well tom wouldn't do it mm. tom cruise wouldn't do it and yet they're really close but just mm. because again tom it's like let's say um uh, you know, Leon was just another worker running around. To him, he's, he's like a nobody. Why is Tom Cruise going to... Um, but Ryan O'Neill, let's say, the reason he did it is because he really looked at Leon as a co-star from Barry Lyndon. Mm -hmm. So that was more of a... Or Danny in The Shining. Danny doesn't talk to anyone. Yeah. But when he heard it was Leon, he... Uh, or Lee Ermey is the same thing. You know, he said if he, you know, it's only Kubrick and Leon that he admires in his whole uh, entire life and career. So um, so it, it's kind of, but you know, people also said, well, why didn't you film with people from the estate, from the Kubrick estate? But again, it's it's a bit, uh, I don't think they want to sit and talk about an assistant. So it's kind of, you know, funny a bit, you know. Um, but, you know, um, the, I think people are out there now that they know the story's out there and they can still do things for Leon and make things better for him if they want to, if they choose to. Um, a question before we uh, open up, and you could also join us with remarks, questions, comments to, to Tony. Um, just a, an aesthetic choice. I was wondering, because uh, you had a, f a lot of uh, live action uh, footage in the film, but also some animations. There were these wonderful drawings, and then uh, you've animated it, and you had the voice of, of Leon commenting on that, and also the blurring. Uh, of the end um, uh, credit sequence, for example, and you already start um, uh, uh, the film with uh, blurred images of, of him. Uh, what was the idea behind these two with aesthetical the, uh, choices? With, with, well, with with the blurring, I think it's um, it's the unknown. You know, it's uh, it's the the people below the line. It's uh, the people that you'll never really see. They're not important. They're not in focus. I guess. Um, um, and what was the other one? You know, the I mean, other I, one, the animations, the hand-drawn... Uh, well, the animation really was simple because Leon had a lot of stories and some of the stories I didn't have any footage for. And I felt like that the best way to to, to, to to evoke or tell these stories is by drawings and just moving around. But I also, we didn't want to overdo it. And, you know, you, you also can see that the film is really harsh lit. And because that, again, was deliberate from the beginning because it's like, I wanted to really show what it was like to be with Leon in his own life. He wasn't like pretty glamorous. He's, he has like a lot of cuts all over his arms. He's been through the mill. You know, he's been through Kubrick machine basically, which destroys you. And um, and I just kept things very realistic that it's that's just the situation he lives. That's how he is. And um, just keep it truthful. And there was a rule from the beginning, no sunset shots, nothing has to do, nothing that has to do or doesn't have to do anything with Leon's story. Just keep it really straightforward and tell it the way it is. Well, um, with the animation, my first impression was it's uh, a little bit like a cartoon or a caricature. So a little bit exaggerated, the, yes. the funny stories and how, how Kubrick is depicted here. Was that also part of the idea? Sure. Absolutely, absolutely. Because again, I didn't have footage for the stuff, and the stories were so amazing, like about the the flair, him screaming at him on, on you know, uh, Christmas night or um, Christmas Eve, or you know, the animals. Like really, I mean, poor Leon had to watch the cat, like kind of completely like dying on the screen for days. Um, so yeah, that, I think that was their personality. I just wanted to kind of, you know, g give it that feeling of that Leon. The, the, those. Um, more of really anecdotes that Leon still cherishes and remembers. We did draw a lot of other stuff to that I didn't use because it just didn't happen. Are there any questions or comments so far to Tony Sierra? We have a mic also coming to you as we are recording this. I, we can hear each other too. Just uh, give us a sign. Yes, please. Yes. 
it's just a remark. Um, I appreciated that you showed this guy as a, so, someone who is full in control, is not a victim. Uh, that's what I thought at the beginning. Oh, this is the assistant of Stanley Kubrick, so he, he had a hard time. He did, that's what he said. But at the end, uh, it's very optimistic and uh, he reclaims that that's his kind of heritage and is proud and is it's very, yeah. um, um, how do you say that, uh, souverain. Um, yeah. No, I appreciate you said that because um, that was also the, uh, um, from the beginning and we used it in the opening, which is, you know, he's walking blurry and you see he looks at a map and it's really at the end, like Leon said, is um, it's about, it's not about the destination, it's about the journey. And he said that he lived an extremely amazing journey and, and we, you know, um, I live in LA and, and Hollywood tends to be also, you know, you meet a lot of people that are like film crew people and they always kind of, they, they never really want to tell you like I'm a gaffer or I'm this. They're almost like I'm just, they always say I'm just. And it's always, I sense they always feel like, you know, there's just, they're not appreciated by the industry or by people. And, um, and, and, and I think Leon shows that really like it's about the journey and Leon really contributed so much and people like Leon contribute so much to filmmaking that, um, and I love that he's so proud of it in the end. And so, yeah, so thank you for seeing that. And it really came to you as a surprise in pre-production that uh, Leon is also living in LA, so you didn't know that before? What do you that, mean? That uh, Leon is living in Los yeah, Angeles? Yeah, he still lives there, yeah. Yeah, he still lives there. Yeah. So, um, that oh, you mean like that he's not working? or? Yeah, or uh, you didn't uh, come across him before uh, with your Kubrick Oh, no, 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 because, um, you know, I mean, Leon before was, was like very busy. He was, myster you couldn't find him. I actually found him through one radio show that he did an interview in another state and had to chase him around and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's also unusual that Leon lives in LA and he's not working. I mean... But um, as you saw in the film, the way Kubrick worked is, uh, is unusual and unique. And when and I'm sure people here in the industry that you know that um, with the union, like if you're a gaffer, you know, you're not supposed to touch the camera. And if you're you can't, you know, move something from here to here, they always say it's not my job. You're not allowed. And he just that's not how he worked. Kubrick put him in every field and um, no one works like Kubrick, you know. I think we have another question. Uh, yes, uh, you touched upon that briefly when you spoke earlier, but I was wondering, Jan Harlan, did he not want to uh, contribute to your film? What? No, it's not that he didn't want to contribute. I think it was given by me. I think he wasn't going to do it if I approached him because, um, you know, I, I knew that they were like a bit d distant in the beginning anyway because Kubrick wasn't there and I think that he was the link. And I just uh, wanted to really, um, I remember going to film with like one of the executives in the film from Warner Brothers and he said, we need to get big names for this this documentary. And I'm like, no, the movie is not about big names. It's about the people below the line and we don't need big names. So I, I really wasn't interested in big names. I was more interested in people that actually was, but I also approached Jack Nicholson, but he was, you know, some people said that he just couldn't remember things anymore. So... Um, I just, it was more of a really creative choice to keep it uh, below the line in a sense and just bring some of the bigger names to to kind of um, um, vouch for the fact of like Leon's abilities and the things he's done, you know. Uh, was it easy at the beginning to um, talk to Leon and uh, was it easy for him to open up for the interviews? Well, yeah, I remember like that's why we had to clean the boxes because he just wouldn't talk. Um, you know, but also to answer, I did show the film to to the Kubricks at their house. So I showed it to to Tian Harlan and to Christiana Kubrick at the house, and uh, um, Christiana loved it. And um, but again, it's like when you're when you're in a Kubrick world, they're like even though they're there, they didn't really know that. I mean, she said there a lot of that stuff she didn't know was going on, because again, Kubrick is just go on and on and on and on all day long that you have no clue what's happening around you. And um, but she did say to me at the end that she said also Stanley and her were both puzzled why Leon gave up acting to be with Kubrick. And, and I was really amazed to hear that because he was puzzled by that. 
because normally no one wants to do that kind of work, especially if you experience being an actor. It's much more, uh, I guess, more glamorous. So Kubrick was really amazed by that. But I think he really loved Kubrick. Uh, he was almost like that father figure or somebody that he really admired creatively that he would have done anything for him. May I just add another question? What what is going to happen to the boxes? I mean, his uh, I mean, obviously the material is quite uh, valuable. Yeah, we, were, we were just talking about that. It, it, there's just so much of it. Um, I know the Academy was also interested after they recorded his oral history, and um, but also maybe the museum here. I mean, we'll see. Um, he, the one thing I know about Leon, he just doesn't want to sell anything. And and I know a lot of people that anybody that had any um, piece of Kubrick or something, they always auction it. This guy would like literally live on the street, but he wouldn't sell anything. So, so either it's going to be in the hands of his children at the end, or if I you could convince him to do something with it, I'm sure, you know. And keep in mind, it's not really perfectly organized by me. It's kind of roughly organized. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know what he wants to do with it. It's uh, it's quite really amazing because there's a lot of communication. Let's say with Kislowski, Leon was almost like the. Um, the uh, the connector between between Kubrick and like whether it was Bergman whether it was uh, a studio whether it was some politician because Stanley didn't like talking to people that much especially when he didn't know them so Leon had uh, a lot of uh, you know amazing moments in connecting with people and um, and a lot of history you know especially film history also, I uh, very much like the way how you included uh, the technical aspects of some of Kubrick's work. For example, the special aperture plate that they had for um, the, the 1.77 for, for Barry Lyndon. Um, there's always so much discussion uh, going on how to screen Kubrick's film in the right aspect ratio or uh, how little is left of the Dr. Strangelove negative, for example. Um, was that also a part of the, the aim of the, the documentary to, to include this from the beginning? Yes, yes. because um, it's not really just Leon as the film worker. You could see that everybody appeared in the film is considered a film worker because um, you know the people that restore all the films at, at Warner in the back lot or the, you know, the other assistant that worked for Stanley for years. I mean, <clears throat> they are film workers in so many ways. Or Steve Southgate, who passed, who gave him a dedication at the end. Um, he was one of the people, too, that just sat in basically every... Um, uh, print he had to watch and actually Steve Southgate um, also was the one that Kubrick handed him the trailer to Eyes Wide Shut to go show it in Vegas and while Steve was in the air Kubrick died and uh, this is just like a long story so they all represent uh, one way or the other another dedication you know of, of, of someone with um, um, they're just their contribution to cinema you know are there other questions comments to Tunisia about film worker, about his collaboration with Leon Vitali. Uh, no. Yes, there's one. Yeah. Please. Do you think Leon has any ambitions to get back into acting? You've told us about his poor health, but maybe after uh, Kubrick's death in the, the last years that he wanted to act somewhere? Yeah, uh, I, I think physically he requires a lot of energy, and I think he's, you know, it's kind of hard for him. I mean, it's hard for him to even just fly here, you know? So it has to be kind of arranged a little bit. So it's not it's not that easy, you know? But yeah, absolutely, you know? he um, He's still occasionally, like, he'll appear and say stuff. He still goes and shows Kubrick's films. So sometimes if um, there's a screening nearby, you know, he, he will go and speak. And um, But now, of course, since the documentary, like, he's been getting more and more requests. So... Um, we were just at Traverse City where um, Michael Moore runs the festival there. And um, actually, Michael Moore every year has a uh, his festival where he has a surprise where he, sur he picks something. And I think this year he picked Film Worker. So he brought Leon and we had, uh, you know, um, uh, what I think it was like about maybe over a thousand people or something. And it was a big discussion about Kubrick and stuff. So he's getting more and more recognition out there and... Uh, but as far as acting, maybe if it's simple, sure. Yeah, I think he still loves acting. You could see, it, you know, and he was—he's really a good, a great actor. You know, how was it in the UK? Are his British TV uh, works yeah, rediscovered? Yeah. He's really well. Rec he's recognizable in in England. 
mm-hmm. because of the Fence Street Gang that used to be. Yeah. And he said he's been in every cop show. And uh, but I think that the big one was once he got Barry Lyndon. I think that's when he started to really get a lot of offers. Um, and he was like, there was going to be a whole series of BBC on him and stuff. But uh, again, he was just uh, he fell in love with Kubrick, and that was it. He wasn't he wasn't going to go back, you know. And um, yeah, he's. He's he's kind of he's quite unique because, well, in the industry, I don't think you find anyone like that anymore in, in in Hollywood because, like we were saying earlier, it's because of the union. You're not allowed to cross over, um, and normally, really, assistants to directors they kind of just talk to them, or they maybe go with them to meetings. But Leon was, you know, how many? I mean, I think he started as an actor, started as an assistant after that, and then by the end, he color corrected. Eyes wide shut. The, the the cinematographer wasn't allowed, but but Leon was because he knew what Stanley wanted. So that's quite an achievement for an assistant, you know. And Leon restored all of Kubrick's films. So it also tells us a lot about indirectly, uh, more or less, um, about Kubrick's decision to move to the UK in the 60s and then stay there yeah. until his death and his position being the auteur within the Hollywood studio system, but working from from the yeah. UK. And that's what that's how when I met Leon, I um, the one thing I did learn about Kubrick that I didn't know, he said that people always make it look like it was Stanley Kubrick, whatever he wanted, he could just pick up the phone and get it. But he said everything was a fight, um, and 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 obviously you can see everything was a fight because of he, he lost Napoleon, he lost Wartime Lies. There were movies that he just couldn't get done. So there's this you know, perception that it was, he was just so powerful. He was just like every other filmmaker when it came to the money. They weren't going to give him whatever he wanted. So, um, but Leon's job was always... Plus also, St- Kubrick had, had had a very intense temper. And I learned that Leon was there to kind of ease things. So, you know, you saw in the film, he could just like decimate you with like a memo or something. And Leon's job with his... British accent always was like to just make things sounds very proper and calm and so everybody would be very happy and then Stanley would push again and then Leon would cool off things it was almost a strategy they he um, and as Leon said no one knew what Leon looked like because he just <laughs> he made him look like this uh, like the MC in uh, in Eyes Wide Shut you know which a lot of people didn't even recognize that that was Leon too you know but um, yeah, that was the relationship. Was fascinating. I mean, I would uh, also uh, like to take up the the ending. Uh, you have this very nice title card at the ending um, that reads that he's now uh, putting together all the the prints for the estate, uh, the the archive of Kubrick's uh, films, and also um, that he supervised the the new 4K restoration yes. uh, of 2001. And uh, that's also, again, very uh, striking compared to the media attention that uh, we had uh, at the Cannes Film Festival this year with uh, focusing more on on Christopher Nolan uh, as being in charge of the the new unrestored version, as they called it at Warner Bros., of the 70mm restoration of uh, 2001. Uh, Would you like to comment on that? Uh, yeah, that Leon did the work, not Christopher Nolan, but that's fine because. Um, but he also loves the fact that Christopher Nolan is connected to it because it just it, it gives the it, it brings people to watch the movie, of course. But I know he worked on the 4K and, and he loved it, and he just finished working to doing 2001 uh, ultra high def, and he said to me that he actually could see the hairs on the apes, like so perfect. But uh, but he also said that like you won't, but it's meaningless if you don't own an uh, an ultra high def monitor, you won't be able to see any of that. But we were talking in the future, of course, it'll be much better. Um, he's also been charged of burning everything. He's already burned, actually did several burns. Um, they basically go to this um, dump. That is like, and they go to the third floor, and there is this huge inferno in there, and then you just burn everything. So all the outtakes that Kubrick had or deleted scenes all go down there, and they get burned. Um, uh, I was gonna film one of those, um, 
but I don't know if I could have stood there and just watched the stuff burn. <laughs> I mean, that would be too much. <laughs> um, but that's what Kubrick wanted. Um, so, yeah, I mean, maybe it drifted from your question, but um, I don't think what was I saying? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I th think there's still uh, so much work to do for him with the, the archive, the film archive. Put yeah, it I mean, again, it's, uh, you know, it depends physically mm. how much he can do. Uh, mm. I, I don't think it's 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 great. I think because of the movie now that he's like officially recognized mm. as doing that. Because you saw in the film the first time when they released all the Kubrick films, they didn't they didn't bring him in, and that's when it was really um, uh, criticized heavily on you know, Amazon and stuff. People were just screaming, and uh, they had to redo everything all over again. But yeah, it requires a lot of. Like, for instance, like every time I go to a festival, especially since Film Worker has been out, um, they've been running Kubrick films to play along with Film Worker. Um, and I'm, I'm, again, amazed that some of the prints look really bad, Kubrick films, you know? So that, again, you know, uh, they restore the stuff, but equally, on the other hand, they don't really grab the old prints out there and get rid of them. And that supposedly costs a lot of money from what they've mentioned, you know? And so, you know, I mean, for researching Kubrick for so many years, he didn't, he, he, he didn't really care about exhibits and things. He, he was obsessed with his movies, the quality of how they're shown. And um, so I think that's something also that like somebody like Leon is valuable for, but you would, because what's the point of restoring and then you still have bad prints that like scratch noise and scratches all over the print. I mean, I saw one, one was Barry Lyndon and, um, and another one was uh, Eyes Wide Shut, and it was the original one with the masks, mm -hmm. you know, the digital masks that we bought in the U.S. that kind of really ruined Eyes Wide Shut, actually. Um, so, yeah, that kind of thing, you know, is um, there's plenty of, for them to do, you know. Just to uh, wrap up a final question, um, you've been uh, together with Leon Vitali to the Stanley Kubrick exhibition. Right. How was it? Could you oh, tell us a little bit yes, about this special yes. experience? Um, yeah, I'll share with you that. Um, well, the cu couple of stories that I can share with you. One is he was, no offense, he was the best tour guide, of course, because he really, and, <laughs> but um, yeah, he's, he took, he probably went about 40 times, at least 40 times. What struck me when I was there is seeing him standing in line and paying for a ticket. Because I thought, mm, somebody like Leon shouldn't really be paying um, because again he was completely ignored with that exhibit they didn't and then the second thing I thought was really amazing was that we were walking around and I, he's, he would say I, I used I used that typewriter I used to sit on that chair I used to it was really weird for me to see a, a man older now going around looking at his own the things he used at an exhibit looking at it with his own eyes I thought that was unique um, and then there were a couple of moments when he would be standing there and uh, Barry Lyndon would be playing on the big screen behind him with the duo and somebody walked up and recognized him you know even though he really looks so different now and um, it was just so beautiful to see that you know occasionally someone would recognize him other times people would think oh there's this guy walking around and uh, and um, you know, but I think since the movie came out, Lachma has been like, like in trouble for because that wasn't really cool what they did that they didn't invite him. You know, um, and I don't think that's going to happen again. And I think when the Academy played two thousand one, they invited him to open it. Um, and at the Academy, the night of the Academy, when they showed Film Worker, um, two of their heads walked up to me, and together they said they apologized. They said we're very sorry that we've overlooked to that man for so many years and that we were going to make it up we'll make it up to him so it's been you know takes time you know Tonizia thank you so much for coming to us thank you for yeah. sharing all your experiences thoughts thank you. film worker and we are of course very much looking forward to SK13 I'll be, I'll be back I'll be <laughs> thanks back. Thank, you. thank you thank you all for coming